So we're going to be talking about uh, product and building and customer loyalty from the get-go. Uh, I'm going to introduce our panelists and uh, say a couple opening remarks, and then we'll jump into questions. Uh, first, we'll start with uh, Donna Wilczek, who's at Coupa, where she's VP of Product Strategy and Innovation. Next, we have Lisa Reeves, who's SVP of Product at Zenefits. Ralph Guti, who's CPO and co-founder of Plan Grid. And John Aniano, who's Chief Product Officer at ProsperWorks. Product management is very near and dear to my heart. I was in product management for about a decade, and product's essential to get right, no matter what stage of the company you're in. Ultimately, it's how you're gonna solve your customer's problem. Also, product has to work very cross-functionally, working with sales and marketing and engineering to understand what's the right product to build and how to deliver it. So I think there's gonna be a lot of juicy issues to talk about, both in product management, also working with the other functions. Uh, and with that, we'll jump into some questions. So first, when you think back, which period of growth was most challenging for you? And what were some of the lessons learned as you went through that one to 100 journey? So I'll leave it open to the panel, whoever would like to jump in first. All right, I'll take that one. So um, I really think about this. So I've been at Coupa now about seven years and started when there were about 30 employees. Now we're over 1,000. And in those early years, before you're really, before you're proven, right, you're trying to get these um, early adopters on your page, getting them as customers. And you're looking at them and saying, look, trust us. We have this vision for this space. It's radically different than everything else out there. It's radically different than what SAP and Oracle and the legacy providers have done. And trust us, it's going to work. It's going to be different. But you have to make that leap with these, with these customers where they have to join your journey with you. And it is a very difficult thing to do to say no, <laughs> to say no to these customers that are saying, no, no, we've been doing this for many, many years. We know how to manage our spending. Just build these features. And we're here sitting in the response saying, I hear you. I know that that's what you've always done. But that's why we're having this conversation, because it's not working for you. So let's open up and have a broader discussion about what we could do if we did it differently. So, um, okay. Did Anyone you jump in? We don't okay, have to go down the line. No, so. Sure. Okay. Yeah. So my experience is kind of different. I joined Zenefits um, last August, and um, we have, you know, we're anchored by a pretty strong customer base. We have a uh, pretty complete product, and I think for us um, right now is the most challenging because we really have to take a point of view about the whole product. It's not simply the features, the product, but it's everything that it's wrapped in. So uh, let's see, we, you know, we have payroll, so there's back office operations, there's support, there's implementation, and that's really challenging. I think we've been really successful in rolling out a lot of product, we've transitioned our business model, but now it's really that overall uh, product vision and, you know, clearly measured by things like, you know, churn, retention, uh, NPS, and customer stat. And so um, for us, you know, it's, uh, it's a big focus area for us now and very challenging. Mm -hmm. I guess we'll just go down the line All right, if, go if that works. Um, so I've always, any, anyone heard of H.P. Lovecraft in the audience? Any H.P. Lovecraft fans? Yeah, all right, there we go. So there's this book by H.P. Lovecraft called The Mountains of Madness. And it was written before people knew what Antarctica was. And in this novel, basically, they're trying to get up this largest mountain in Antarctica, and they have no idea what's past it. And so they make their way up their mountain, they fight aliens, they fight monsters, people die. And when they reach the top, they, they see the pinnacle and the this clouds clear, and beyond the mountain is yet another mountain that's quite larger. And so they go bottom, they go up, they lose more people, they get to the top of that mountain, and guess what's at the top past that mountain? another mountain. Um, so echoing what you just said, the current moment of a successful growing business is always the hardest to me. Mm -hmm. yeah. Product management is the mountains of madness is basically <laughs> yeah. what I'm I like that one. I think that, we can quote that. Um, for me, and uh, not quite so literary of, a, of an answer, but I think, you know, uh, in, in SaaS, there's a couple ways to attack starting the company and starting your markets. And so you can either start an SMB and grow up to bigger, bigger companies. That's a model I've, I've been involved with more often. So that's a model I feel comfortable speaking about. There are different ways to do it and you can start in the mid-market and that's a little bit harder. Um, but I think when, when you grow the way a lot of SaaS companies grow, which is starting from SMB and going to mid-market, product is completely different from 
you know, your first phase, which is zero to five or zero to 20, depending on your market. And uh, product is very, it's sort of almost like consumer product management. It's extremely user focused. It's extremely uh, design focused. And you're really inventing and changing the world. And that's fun. And it's a, one set of people to do that. I think one of the hardest transitions, I've made this a few times, so I feel the pain and I have the scars, is once you're like, okay, we have product. We have product market fit, we're selling. We're now gonna hire a bunch of marketing people and a bunch of salespeople, and they hate you. Because what this marketing and salespeople are doing is they're going and selling the customers and they're losing deals because you don't have features X, Y, and Z, but you've got, these, you've got a product team who is really invested in, in changing the way things work, and the customers and the buyers and the salespeople are really invested in just getting the stuff that closes the deal or, or solves the problem. And so it creates this tension. It often creates a new team. Um, and going through those shifts, which is kind of like once you hit the top of the mountain and you've got to go fight more <laughs> aliens, you need a different team to fight different monsters and things like that. And so anytime there's a shift in go to market, I think product goes through a w wacky period. Yeah. And, uh, and that can be kind of hard. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you know, a common theme I heard, uh, Donna, with your remarks about uh, gaining trust with users. And John, what you're talking about, really gaining trust with sales and marketing and other Certainly. functions. And the buyer. And the buyer. Yeah. How, how do you think about first building trust and then you know, how do you recapture trust when things might go off the rails? Things don't go off the rails. <laughs> <laughs> Never goes off the rails. <laughs> um, so I think, um, so we have um, a lot of internal stakeholders and constituents internally that we work with, like the sales and marketing folks and then you know, growth and activation, everyone has an opinion, everyone has an input. And so we've um, instituted just a number of ways kind of to get feedback internally, a number of processes to act on that. Um, we're pretty inclusive and transparent in terms of what we provide. We're also really careful in terms of what we provide as well so that we're not out selling something that we know, you know, is not gonna really be ready for GA, you know, for um, some period of time. So for us, it's a it's a kind of a formal structure that we have, and then I would say also just a lot of informal uh, communication with our stakeholders and internal teams. Yeah. Basically, you have to end up communicating so much that it's a little painful. Um, it feels a little embarrassing to repeat yourself over and over and over again, but you just have to get over it. Um, as well as I think everything you said rings true to me. It's just a ton of stakeholders, a ton of meetings, a ton of communication. Yeah, I agree. And just to add on to that, I think when there are different stakeholders and there's a lot more communication, it's almost like the, the product team or the product people involved need to learn a new language every time. So yeah. Yeah. At, you know, when you have a broad marketing go to market, you need to learn the language of the marketers that are going to do that, whether that's PR and AR, whether that's um, you know, uh, having launchable features that aren't quite ready in the product, which make product and engineering kind of a little bit concerned, but that's kind of the way it's done. Um, or the sales team, like when you're talking about closing larger deals and going wall to wall and shifting the way that the product is sold, that's a different language. And so learning a new language each time you go through one of those phases can be difficult for teams. Mm -hmm. But it's also a way to gain trust. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that um, this whole gaining trust is a really critical component. And when I think about trust, right, it takes a long time to build trust, but it doesn't take a lot to lose it all, yeah. right? And the really important thing, um, when we started Coupa and we were building, we built around a set of core values of ensure customer success, focus on results, and strive for excellence. And a lot of businesses have these core values and they write them on their walls and then they ignore them. And say, so, yeah, we have a mission, we have a vision, we have core values. But what we tried to do at Coupa is we really tried to live these core values internally with one another as well as externally. So you'll see a lot of debates happening internally around, well, are we actually ensuring customer success? Is the right answer to say no? Um, be authentic. What's the truth, right? Um, recently, people were like, well, we need to create this better, bigger blockchain story. And I'm like, yeah, absolutely. Let's tell them truth. Let's tell them what we've worked on, what's going on in the labs, but we're not going to make up something. We're not going to fabricate it. We're going to tell them the truth, we're going to be authentic, and we're going to keep that going. And if they don't want to use Coupa for that, that's fine. They might not be a great fit. And it's the same thing within sales, it's within marketing, it's within our success team, it's everyone. We start with ensuring customer success by being truthful and earn that trust. Because that foundation, just when there's problems, 
you can lean back on that trust you've built. Mm -hmm. Got it. So if you think back around the different changes in the product, can you point to times where there was a product breakthrough that then drove an inflection point of growth for the company? Multi-products. Um, when we initially started Plain Grid, we just kept giving everything out for free in our main product line until we had a suite. And it was great, you know, we were at the early stage kind of on the consumer side, you know, let's just keep giving our customers what they want. And then eventually we realized, uh oh, we better start charging for some of these things. Um, and that was actually a huge inflection point for us, both emotionally and operationally as a company to start charging for new um, major functionality. Yeah. yeah, say more about the, the emotional side, like was there the debates or like kind of different views that you had to reconcile well, amongst the like, company? Well, certainly there's a, a class of person um, that we had hired that was really in tune with the consumer side and the customer side, and for them, um, it was actually a challenge, it sounds kind of silly, but it was actually a challenge to explain how like businesses need to make money. Um, like we have to charge <laughs> more increment or value. And like that was a hard conversation right. to have yeah. with some people. They were, they were more on the mindset of like, let's just spread really broad, just try to get our message out there. Um, we also ended um, license changes as well. We uh, used to have a freemium plan that we no longer have. That was a major change for us as well. So these types of things are both hits on the internal team that are used to operating a certain way. Um, everything we did actually worked out quite well for our business, so the business responded very well, but sometimes you have to continuously over-communicate why we're doing the things we're doing. For us, um, in our industry, it was, um, again, back to the basics. When In 2006, when we started, this whole concept of cloud computing was rather novel still, right? And it seems funny to think about this now, but throughout the years, we've had to make very strong decisions on behalf of our customers. We're gonna do things multi-tenant SaaS. We're not going to have everyone on all these different versions. In the early days, we had to. We had to have all these customers in these uh, different versions because that's what they wanted. They wouldn't join us on this journey through the years. However, we've gotten them to a point where now they recognize what this is all about. But this true multi-tenant SaaS configuration is so critical. I remember walking in on my first day on the job and I sat down to learn the software. They're like, just sit down and learn it. I'm like, I can't learn it, it's enterprise software, it's impossible, right? And I learned it and I came to a screen and it was this configuration screen of chart of accounts in our industry. And I went up to my boss at the time, mortified myself, I'm like, why? why are we doing this via configuration? We could charge so much money to our customers for the screen, right? And he's like, yeah, that's why we're not a services company. We're gonna do this completely multi-tenant SaaS. So that was transformational from um, this industry and what we're doing. Love that. Um, for me, there, uh, there are two kind of inflection points that I've seen re repeated over and over that really unlock the potential of a business, especially on the path from zero to 100. Mm -hmm. And one of those is, and I obviously I spent 10 years at Salesforce, so I can't leave the stage without saying the word platform. <laughs> like, uh, I, think, I think one of the things that a lot of companies do when they start uh, you know, a SaaS product is they say, we are gonna do the best possible experience and we know exactly how to do this business process, whether it's mm -hmm. CRM or support or um, you know, purchasing, whatever that is, um, and that works for the first phase. But the second phase, when you're actually selling to a different set of customers, you're selling to larger customers, there are things they're gonna want it to do, the product, that you didn't build into the product. And so it's, it's, it's going from making something simple and easy and working out of the box to then making things possible that you're never going to build. And so uh, when you get to the point where you're, you're including some platform capabilities for mass customization of the product or major customization of the product, that becomes a definite inflection point in both go to market and, and success if you, if you have the, the product to back it up. And the other one is, um, when you shift from sort of hand-holding every customer of every size to sort of automating certain parts of the business with onboarding. So if you sold really well to zero to 100 employee companies in your first phase, um, chances are that the economics of that don't scale and the product has to take on the burden of doing that. And I think company, there's some companies that have done this very well, like Zendesk has done this extremely well um, to, to great success. Yeah, and how does the product team, like how does you, your role in the organization how does the product management change, right, when you start going through these changes? Yeah, yeah. I think um, I feel very strongly about uh, entering platform capabilities intentionally. And so from a team perspective, hiring a head of platform, somebody who's done it before, somebody who, mm -hmm. for better or for worse, has actually seen what Salesforce looks like or seen what SAP or Oracle looks like, mm -hmm. you know, God forbid. Is, is, that, is that a liability, though, if they're 
coming from a mindset of kind of a bigger platform, lots of resources, than someone who's come from a scrappy kind of startup full stack yeah, approach? I, I, yeah, I, I think the question, it, it's certainly a liability. You definitely don't want to hire the wrong person in any, in any role, particularly product where the, the impact can be long to see and can be outsized. Um, but I think you have to think about where you want the company to be in two to three years when you hire a product person. And sometimes the product and, and, and the team is different. And so you have to, you have to prepare for that um, with steps along the way. I don't know if it's necessarily a liability. I think it's more finding that right person, regardless of where their background came from. And that hiring process needs to be really a critical element. Um, I know we sometimes challenge ourselves internally, like, are we taking too long to find the right person? Should we just settle? And continually, we're just saying no. Not, don't settle, just keep going. You'll find the right person, even if they came from a large organization, right? In this growth phase of you know, zero to 100, you're inevitably gonna be faced with finding people that have done this before, people that have grown teams. So instead of individual contributors doing things to people that have experience managing teams. So your hiring profile may change, but stick true to your core and your culture and find those people that have those um, inherent capabilities within them to wanna do something great, are committed to customer success, and ultimately, where they came from, as long as they're exhibiting those things and that they want to do something great, I think it's a, it's, it'll be a great fit. I think for us, um, because it's an HCM platform, uh, we're really careful about how we hire and how we build teams. We need to have a certain level of domain expertise. You know, payroll is a commodity, but payroll simply has to work, you know, and there can be no question about that. And so there's room for domain experts who know it from an ADP perspective. There's room for, you know, um, people that are much younger in their career. We're very thoughtful about how we put these teams together, and it's because we drive a lot of mission critical stuff in benefits and in payroll. And um, we have a real need to be able to scale the platform. And so typically you find some individuals who have done it before, you know, successfully. And I think it's really interesting now, you know, when you look at somebody's life cycle, they can be an operator, they can be an investor, they can be an entrepreneur. And it's just, it's really exciting, I think, to get the right kind of team together. It's a challenge, but um, when it works, it really works. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Lisa, in your background particularly, you've, you've been an investor, you started your own company, an early stage company, you've been at Workday, now at, at Benefits. Um, and what, what stood out to you in all those experiences? What, have, what has helped you be the best kind of product person you are now? Anything, um, anything I, stand out? Yeah, so I think it's probably a real appreciation on the customer kind of feedback loop, the customer iteration, kind of product market fit, because as an investor, you're always looking for that in the deals that you do. As an entrepreneur, it's like, you know, game on, you know, your first job. And then as an operator, it gives you the ability, I think, to scale, which is really tough for a lot of entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. so. Mm -hmm. so. Let's shift the dialogue to how product engages with other functions, right? Namely, sales and marketing. Uh, it's common that there are different points of view and sometimes contention between these different groups. Can you talk about what were some of the hot spots that entrepreneurs in the audience should look out for and what are some of the ways that you resolve um, the, so any, uh, any of the challenges of, of collaborating with these other teams? I think it's important to be politically aligned with your sales and marketing cohort. And so I don't think there are any problems. <laughs> I think everyone just gets along. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just <laughs> um, no, I think I, I think for me it's a it, uh, it's always a question of tension, right? Marketing needs to tell a story, and there's a tension in marketing between what the product can do, what it will do, and the path between there and the gray area in that space. And so I think you said it. It's it's just insane amount of communication to keep people happy and keep people aligned. I think on the sales side, I think it depends on the phase that you're in. I think if you are at a horizon and you're looking to grow at a different uh, pace, a lot of times the sales team is the best place to learn about what you, know, what you should be doing in the product. Um, so I, I don't know, I recommend, <laughs> I, I recommend constant and open communication and openness between product teams and, and the go-to-market functions. One to 100 is such a broad range. We had very strong product market fit in the beginning, so we had no sales and marketing for 
for much of the early stage of this. And I, I would say that is a theme through all of our comments. One to 100 is an extremely broad range. There's been, it's a totally different company at one uh, than it is at much later stages. So early on, we had no sales and marketing. We had uh, the role of customer success, more like an right. amped up QA support person. Um, and we worked very closely with them as a team. We were only about 10, 12 people, so how could you not? Um, as the company scaled and we brought in seasoned sales leadership, and you know now we have a sales team of many hundreds of people, um, the relationship changes a lot, I've noticed. Yeah. It does become much more, uh, like I think you said earlier too, like they just are disappointed about the deals they might have lost. Um, and that requires a different type of communication, a more empathetical communication. Something mm -hmm. I find is really helpful is we send our product managers out with sales, not only for customers, but also for prospects. I find that one thing that's really gapped is you have user research, they're talking to all your customers, that's great, but you never really get your product management team in front of prospects, it's hard to do. So we use conferences as a way to do that. They make, we make product man booths, um, and that helps them be aligned with what's happening in the sales and marketing teams, um, and because they're hearing it from the customer's mouth just like the sales and marketing team are. Thank you. I think we had a, um, a little bit of a different experience, um, closer to what Ralph, you're describing in the early days um, of building these small sales teams largely CSM customer success days, yeah. getting sales ramped up, bringing sales in. But the one thing we did at Coupa is that the product organization it was joined at the literal hip with the sales team. Mm -hmm. I mean, product went to the sales meetings and they sat in the same rooms and they talked about how the product worked and operated and what our vision was directly to the prospects. And so we're learning along the way. Um, because we were creating this industry from this fragmented space of siloed solutions into something radically different, we needed product to sit in the rooms and be the visionary and help sales. Um, we're luckily in the space now where the product is really truly recognized as leading space, so we don't have some of these challenges. Usually the loss reports are, oh, politics, politics, politics versus product, which is a really great place to be in. Lucky you, yep. yeah. Very yeah, lucky. Really nice. Seriously, yeah. it's incredible. Some days I'm like, oh, but the only way it happened is because of this really close alignment with our sales organization and our customers. I mean, we have hundreds of customers on our customer advisory boards, our product teams travel, they go on site, our developers and engineers actually sit in customer advisory boards directly. We're trying to build something very different than what we've all done in the past. And I think that speaks to why the product fit is so closely aligned to what the actual industry needs and what people do in a day-to-day in a -day world. Yeah, I would agree with everything that was said. And it's just like over-communicate. And you know, I'm like, are you kidding me? I'm going to say this like again <laughs> and again. It's just it's, never it's, it it's truly amazing. And the only other thing I would add is, um, uh, on the support side, we work a lot with our support associates as well mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to understand what's coming in. Mm -hmm. Great point. Have you ever had a, a case where you had to kill a product? How did you make that decision, right, when it was just not working? We, no we, no yeah, dead products, I amazing. Mean, uh, we just got it right the first time. Yeah. 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 <laughs> you let, let it up faster. <laughs> we do an icebox approach for a while. You know, we leave it kind of half alive uh -huh. just to see if there's a few, there's always a few, I don't know, for, for our products that we might want to kill, there's a few customers that still really like it. There's some need. Often we find when we have to kill products, we didn't do one thing really well, we did 10 things kind of crappily, you know, and yeah. then it just didn't really find the right fit. So we just, we keep it out for the, for the customers that are really using the crap, the few customers mm -hmm. that are really using the crap out of some of these, <laughs> this one particular product I'm thinking of, just to see maybe there's something new that could rise like a phoenix from the ashes of this project. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> That's sad. That's really sad. Yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> but um, so for, for me, I think uh, there is a tendency in product management, again, especially in SaaS, to over-rotate on, on killing products and experimentation yeah. the way that consumer software does. In the enterprise space in SaaS, there's a reason you built something. You may not have built it right, yeah. um, but you were in a market or you, were, you had a certain customer and you built it for a reason. Mm -hmm. um, so the question I think in, in, in SaaS is not, you know, how quickly do you kill a product? It's, is there a shift in go to market that makes this feature incongruent with how we're trying to sell? Um, and I think what most often happens in SaaS, at least in my experience, is that we don't kill products. They just have an end of service or an end yeah. of support or an end of life. Yeah, yeah. And it's got this long, long life that lives on. And so the questions to ask are, 
do we change the pricing and packaging about around this particular feature? Do we not include it in net new customers anymore, but let it sit in our existing customer base? Do we supersede it with platform functionality that allows a customer to achieve that same goal without that being in the product? So there's a, there's a very different world of killing products in, in enterprise SaaS. And I find when I bring on new members of the team that come from consumer, they're ready to just kill everything. They just want to kill it all. We tested it, didn't work, it's gone. Well, <laughs> why did you test it and who's using it and who's not? Yeah, using I've it? seen yeah. the same thing yeah. like when you interview someone who's yeah. come from more of an on-premise software environment. Mm -hmm. You know, the whole idea of like building something that you didn't need, I like, can't even get my head I around can't that. Either. Yeah. <laughs> it's true. Yeah. It's true. Yeah, don't don't start. Yeah, definitely do your homework, get close to your customers, understand the space, understand where you want to go with this vision, and then work with these customers on defining what it is in these design phases. So before you roll something out. And what we do is we do something called an early access program. So once we develop a new set of capabilities, we make it available for our customers on kind of a limited release, and they're using it and giving us feedback back that we then rapidly incorporate in before we bring this out globally. And I think that really helps because you get these real world use cases and then get the feedback into the product really quickly so that by the time it is a product, it's used yeah. and it's adopted yeah. and you don't have to worry about killing it later because no one wants to kill our little children, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is all great ideas. Yeah, we actually, the product I was referring to is limited release. So we yeah. use that strategy too. So we're not even losing that much by having it there. Yeah. Exactly. Great. Well, one more question and then we'll wrap up. This one is maybe a bit more controversial. So if you think about the journey from 1 to 100, what do you think is the importance of product execution versus sales and marketing execution to really get you to that successful outcome? How, you know, how if you're, if you're ballpark marketing, relative, how, relative how many sales and marketing people in the room? Okay. Product is way more important. Yeah. <laughs> as a, as a co-founder, you don't have a company without a product. It's all about the product. So I'm putting product on 100%. Um, that being said, when sales and marketing isn't executing, it's sometimes like the pistons of an engine. You know, product's right. doing really great, and then it's like sales and marketing starts building up, and they're like, oh, yeah, and then product has to catch up, and you kind of balance yourselves out, but it's, you're generally selling a product. Yeah, for me, a more serious answer, just real fast. I think I think it all depends on the phase, and I think I, you know this goes back to the beginning, which is, if you don't have a product, you don't have a company. Yeah. The first phase is always about product, and then the the you know the mix shifts. And so, if you've got a new go-to-market strategy, you're going to be spending a lot of time thinking about how product can serve the the, the sales and marketing strategy. If you have to create a multi-product company, then product takes the reins again. And so it's this sort of pendulum that swings. Yeah. Um, in various phases of life. But I love my sales and marketing peers. They're amazing. Please don't <laughs> tell them I said products. <laughs> yeah, I don't, uh, you know, I don't think you can get to 100 million in enterprise software without really building out that sales and marketing function as well. Um, when I look at it, I don't limit it to just sales and marketing and product. I really look at it as, as all these functions around the company, right? Support, services, alliances, um, sales and marketing, product, all of these capabilities that are running and everyone truly has to be executing. If you're gonna make it, you all have to be executing together as a team. And at any given point in time, you're going to see parts of the organization that maybe are having issues more than others. And it's at those critical points that you identify that, that you try to figure out how can the rest of you help that part of the, or of the organization. In our early days, and some of our releases, we had a lot of bugs and they were just simply, all hands on deck. Can our solution consultants come and test? Can they do some quality assurance with us? I mean, that's not what they're paid to do, but we had a need in this function, and the only way we were gonna execute and get past it by was, by, was by getting those resources. Or sometimes sales and marketing is having those issues, and they need the product team to step up and do conferences or provide content and domain because product marketing is needing resources. So it's really, I don't see, um, it's an interesting They're question. They're, They're all important, important. Yeah. and at given points in time of your growth, you're going to see areas of need. And the thing to remember is just remember everyone is one company, one team. Stop any type of infighting. Everybody should be joined at the hip to get this company to the next level. Great. All right, well, please join me in thanking our panelists.